It actually leads to a really ugly uh, split within the March on Washington movement in which most of the women um, actually leave the movement, um, focus their work on uh, their, own, their, their own respective unions. Um, it's a great quote from uh, Sidney Wilkinson, who was one of the staffers, um, after she pointed out that the, the March on Washington movement had a mostly female staff. They kept not paying the staff, telling them they would be paid later, that they didn't have enough money. And then they hired a man at twice the salary of any of the women um, and paid him. And they all walked out. They actually considered um, uh, picketing Randolph. Um, and and uh, well, as Wilkinson said, um, she said, and, and this is the group which is working for a law to promote fair employment practices, she asked with bitter sarcasm. Don't make me laugh. Um, so in, I think in comparison, it was actually relatively easy to overcome these conflicts over anti-communism. Um, and this leads to the emergence in the mid-1950s of a revived civil rights unionism um, that in some respects becomes much more effective and much more powerful than even the civil rights unionism of the 1940s. Um, this actually importantly emerges in response to the emergence of a movement in the South. And the initial sort of catalyst is that civil rights act or union activists in north, mostly northern cities uh, see these emerging movements in the South, and they start to unify as a way of, or, of raising money and calling attention to this. Um, this is an image uh, on the, the left-hand image is a rally that was uh, organized in New York City in the Garment Center uh, by the NAACP and District 65, which was Clinton Robinson's uh, union. Um, you can see Adam Clayton Powell speaking. Uh, Ella Baker is on the lower left-hand side. She's then the uh, the president of the New York uh, branch of the NAACP. And then just to her left is Cleveland Robinson. Um, one thing that I think is amazing about these images of these rallies is just the size of the, the, the demonstrations that were, that were emerging in uh, big, in northern, mostly in northern cities uh, in the late 1950s. Um, Robinson, Cleveland Robinson, Ella Baker, um, A. Philip Randolph, Bayard Rustin, all people who had sort of emerged out of the March on Washington movement, organized initially in, friend, in friendship to as basically a, a fundraising network, among, mostly among northern black trade unionists uh, in New York, Chicago, and Detroit, to raise money for an organization that eventually became the, student, or the, the, the SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Um, in addition to supporting these emerging movements in the South, the black trade unionists also revived links between civil rights and labor movements in northern cities. And most of the people who would end up forming the Negro American Labor Council um, led movements within local branches of the NAACP and of CORE to, in effect, take these over from people that they saw as, as liberals. So they, they, there was a, there was, they were able to displace what they saw as a liberal leadership um, with, with uh, often explicitly socialist radical politics. Um, and the Negro American Labor Council actually emerged out of this process. Um, this, these are just some images of uh, black trade unions forging ties with uh, civil rights activists. There's on um, the upper left-hand corner is Herbert Hill, who became the, um, the director of the NAACP's labor department. With, um, He's meeting with the uh, fair employment practice of the uh, United Auto Workers. In the center, you see uh, Ella Baker, who's second from the left, meeting with um, Cleveland Robinson. This is Maida Springer and A. Philip Randolph meeting with um, other leaders of, the, of Randolph's union, the sleeping car porters. Um, in 1959, the NAACP held its annual convention in New York City. Um, and the New York Labor and Industry Committee hosted a meeting to talk about how to reform the AFL-CIO. And this is, the, this is the origins of the Negro American Labor Council. Um, this is a period in which um, the black trade unionists were increasingly critical of the AFL-CIO, primarily over the policy of tolerating white supremacist unions within the AFL-CIO. So what they wanted to, they wanted to, um, the AFL to expel any unions that did not allow black members. Um, and this led to a series of clashes between black trade unionists and the leadership of the AFL-CIO um, that culminated uh, in uh, Randolph actually being uh, censored by the 
uh, by the, the executive council of the AFL-CIO. And this is when black trade unionists say, we need to organize this demonstration in Washington at the headquarters of the AFL-CIO, sort of evoking the 1941 march. A number of them said, yeah, let's, let's march on Washington. Um, this is a good idea. Uh, the, uh, I just want to, maybe I can't back up. Um, one, just, I wanted, to, sorry, I skipped one image that I wanted to talk a little bit about in terms of the, um, both the, the degree to which black trade unionists were able to emerge in, in leadership positions in mostly northern urban black communities um, and really start to set the tone of a new black politics that was emerging in the 1950s and an explicitly socialist politics. Um, this is, that's great, this is an image of a, um, a demonstration in the early 1960s in the garment district. I mean, you can see the scale of these demonstrations, and I actually cropped this, these, you know, those sort of wall-to-wall -wall people um, filling up an entire New York City <laughs> Avenue. Um, the, this is a demonstration, this is a, 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 a Malcolm X speaking at a, de a demonstration that was organizing in 1962 by a committee, it was called the Committee on Economic and Social Problems, which Randolph actually asked, um, this is uh, Ann Arnold Hedgeman, who had been the coordinator, one of the coordinators of the March on Washington movement, Randolph asked her to coordinate this, um, this coalition of black trade unionists and civil rights activists in Harlem um, to, to address a number of issues, including uh, the unionization of um, black and Latino uh, hospital workers. This is a, the, the, so they're here supporting the hospital workers. Um, I think one of the things that we see here is the degree to which black trade unionists are able to actually reorient black politics in these cities. Um, and as, the, as one of the, uh, an article in the NALC newsletter proclaimed, you know, this indicates how the building of unity required an understanding of the historic role to be played by the black working, the black working class, an explicitly Marxist argument um, being made, you know, at a period that I think is commonly seen as the sort of um, the low point of black radicalism in the United States. Um, now, this does not mean, and I go into detail in the paper, how they, they are grappling with anti-communism. They remain extremely critical of McCarthyism um, and try to renegotiate and navigate this problem um, without either conceding to Cold, Cold War liberalism or, importantly, I think, um, without, without embracing the Communist Party. And all of them remain extremely critical of the Communist Party um, throughout this period. Um, and this is the context in which the March on Washington emerges in, 19, in the early 1960s. Um, united behind the NALC, they were, black trade unionists had more influence over African American politics than at any point in the Second World War. They had um, chapters in 23 cities, mostly industrial uh, cities in the Northeast, but also Georgia, Florida, and California. Um, membership estimates are really hard to get at, and they, they vary widely from about 4,500 to over 10,000. But I, I think it's important to keep in mind that each of these members, most of these members are um, in leadership positions in both unions and civil rights organizations at the same time. So they have an influence that goes far beyond what their, their numbers would suggest.